Well, good morning, everyone. We have surgery tomorrow. How's everyone this morning? Awake or tired? You're the tired because you were kept awake from all of the fireworks yes. last night, yes. or you were up doing the fireworks last night, right? <laughs> 50 miles of elbow room. <laughs> I know we had a great group of uh, young adults here last night, uh, just a small gathering uh, of those that wanted to get together and celebrate. So we had a fun time, uh, had a little barbecue meal before, and then went out and had some fun uh, with fireworks, just celebrating. Again, our freedom that we have here in the United States, and uh, just really celebrating that freedom and recognizing uh, of course, the sacrifice of those who have given their lives, ultimate sacrifice, in order for us to be able to have that freedom. And of course, what we do today, the ability to come together to worship freely, our God who is good, our God who is amazing, our God who has done great things, we have the ability to do that because of their sacrifice. And of course, we also celebrate Jesus who's given the biggest sacrifice, uh, who's given us freedom that can't be bought or purchased any other way. Right? Yeah. He's given us freedom and eternal life. So that's who we celebrate today in this place, in this house. Um, it's so great to have Alice and Grandma Amen. and their family here with us this morning. Welcome. Amazing, again, amazing testimony of what God has done, and we'll get to hear that this morning. So we just come to celebrate, we come to worship, so if you'll join me in standing, we'll start with worship this morning, and honor our God. Heavenly Father, we come this morning to glorify who you are, to give your name honor in this place, to recognize who you are and what you've done for us and in us, God, and what you want to do through us. Yes. So, Lord, we surrender to what you want to do here in this place today. Holy Spirit, come. We invite you to fill this place even now. Lord, even during, during this time of worship, this time of praise, God, let your presence be so thick, so heavy, so great. God, reveal yourself to each and every heart here today. And everyone joining online, God minister to them where they are. Lord, either because of uh, physical distance or because of uh, just safety, God, for their health, God, and what, why they have to be uh, absent from us this morning. We still pray for a blessing to be on them in their gathering. God, as we worship together in spirit, Lord, we love you. We honor you. We magnify you in Jesus' name. Amen.
today. Um, I got announcements. Uh, one announcement I want to make, or actually a couple quick ones here. Uh, on July the 14th, sometimes I get myself in trouble, and uh, I'm beginning to think that, and sometimes I bite off more than I can chew, 
And uh, I think on uh, I have done that on July the 14th. I'm not even sure if Al got it in the in the bulletin or not. But with Convoy of Hope, which is an Assembly of God program that, that reaches out to people in need, in crisis, they somehow have come upon, and they did it over in York back in June, we have, I have said yes to an 18-wheel semi-truck load of 860 cases of produce to be dropped off here at the church on July the 14th, which is a Tuesday. <laughs> and I need all my friends to help me distribute it and I need all my friends to help me come and even if you're not a friend of mine I'd still like your help um, I need a pallet jack or two and I need some kind of a forklift a, their own pallets to get this stuff out of the truck and so I'm, I'm looking for those kind of things I don't own either of those but uh, I'm looking for that and I'm looking for some muscles that day and Caesar I think we ought to take a bunch of those down there to your store after we get them off the truck and uh, put a sign up, Northridge, because you did a great job distributing food uh, from your uh, store. But I've seen the pallets, they're about this long, or they're about, or the cases, they're about this wide, about, or long, about that wide, and about this deep, filled with all kinds of, of, of fruits and vegetables. And so uh, it, it's a good thing, people like that stuff, and we want to minister to the people in our community. And we want to say, hey, we love you. Here at Northridge, we love you, and we want to bless you. July 14th, don't leave me hanging, okay? Uh, I know Paula can't help me unload, and Sean and Kayla, I mean, there's four of us, okay? And <laughs> Kayla will probably find a way to work that day, so she doesn't have to be here. But anyway, uh, we really, really need your help. Now, I um, also want to remind you that this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the first three days, start the first three weekdays in the new month, and uh, that's our bridegroom fast. The day when we say, hey, would you fast and pray with us here at Northridge for God to move and God to send revival. And, uh, you know, I, I, and I've been thinking this week, and of course this is the second, today is the second uh, sermon in the series, Prayers of the Bible. And I believe that is a cru we are at a crucial time in America. And the only thing that we can really do is to pray that God would intercede, uh, that God would intervene as we intercede, and God would take care of things. I have already begun praying for November the 3rd, the election day. God, have your way in our country on that day. I am bombarded uh, by, uh, by different things on Facebook, me, them wanting me to give money to beat this guy, to beat that guy, to beat this guy. And I agree with all what they're telling me. But you know what? It's prayer that's going to win this thing. Amen. And we've got to take back our nation through prayer. So uh, um, so let's just do that. I also want to say thank you very much for your faithfulness in giving. We have buckets sitting around the church today. Feel free to uh, deposit and fill those right to the brim with, uh, with your offerings. We continue to do very well through this pandemic time. We continue to do well. It's about four months now that we have been, you know, just doing so well in the offerings. Now, it's not like we've got an abundance, but we are doing well. And it's because of your faithfulness. And uh, I just say thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, so ushers, the invisible ushers came and they're at the back with those little buckets. Feel free to deposit them. And, uh, and if you want to give online, if you want to give, you know, send it in the mail to the church here or, or drop it by my house if you have cash. Some of you have been doing that. I've got a metal bucket there on my porch, front porch. You put it in there, shut the door, and it's locked. So I don't even have to be there for you to give your million dollars, okay? And uh, I'll just pick it up later. Okay, we, uh, we are in for a treat today. Because Alice and Grandma Nico are going to conclude this service. Because I told Pastor Chris, I said, how can I preach? I would be boring to myself after a testimony of them. So, and, it, and as, and as uh, Alice contacted me, what she, you know, she's basically sharing about what God's done. And it fits, it, and I already had my servant figured out, it fits so perfectly with what I want to talk to you about today from the Bible, okay? And I want us to look today at Genesis chapter 24, and we're going to go through a lot of Genesis 24, and I'll, I'll read a few, and then I'll talk, and I'll read a few more verses, and I'll talk, but we won't go through the whole chapter, but it is a great chapter, I love the story in there, and so let me begin by reading Genesis 24, starting in verse 1, Abraham was old and well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the chief servant in his household, 
the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living. But you will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. Let's pray. Jesus, as we look at your word today, I pray, God, that you would quicken the thoughts and the, and the insights that you have for our lives. Help us to take what was mentioned in the story in those days and apply it to our lives today in 2020. In Jesus' name, amen. Now remember, Abraham had, had Isaac when he was 100. So he, here he is, 140, and his son is 40 years old. And he hasn't found a wife yet. And, uh, and when you're 140 and you don't have any grandkids, yeah, you gotta get, you got to help your son out a little bit. you got to start moving that direction. <clears throat> now, it's customary at that time for parents to arrange the marriages of their children. How, you know, how <laughs> that was in the day, it was an accepted practice. Now, and I guess maybe uh, I, I, Abraham was a little nervous that Isaac wasn't going to be able to figure one out, so he was going to make sure he got one for him for sure. But this custom, can you imagine bringing that custom into 2020 for a minute? Now, I, for one, would favor that custom now. If by a certain age my sons had not found a wife, I should be able to go find him a wife and give that wife to that son and say, here, this one's going to be a good one. Man, it is really quiet in here now. We're thinking. Yeah, you're thinking about it. After all, I'm older. I know what it means and what it takes to have a good wife. Now, parents... Was there ever a time when your child was dating someone and you thought, oh, no way. Yeah. Or you saw someone else who you thought would be a lot better choice for them? Uh-huh. My father-in-law thought that for Paula at one time. The week of our wedding, my father-in-law said to one of her sisters, I think Paula's making a mistake. Oh. Well, she might have, but she's been stuck with me for 40 years come a couple of weeks. I proved him wrong, and about 10 years later, he really kind of started liking me about 10 years later. I had to work on that. But parents, even though you don't want to admit it, I believe it is so true that at least some of the time we would like to help our kids out and pick the right choices. I know there were, there were girls, that, uh, not Thomas, not Thomas found the perfect one, but uh, the, you know, <laughs> the others, they were dating girls who were like, I just don't know about these, you know, I just don't know. I hope my sons aren't watching today. I'm in big trouble. Now, teenagers, how would you like it if your parents were the ones who chose who you would marry? I'm guessing probably none of you would want that sort of an arrangement. And uh, we all want the ability to choose. Sometimes we choose good. Sometimes we don't choose so well. And I'm sure Abraham wanted his son Isaac to get married and give him a grandchild. I understand that. He wanted a grandson. So Abraham decided to take matters into his own hands. Now Abraham called the chief, his chief servant, which if we were to look back at Genesis 15, 2, we believe that that's Eleazar. Okay? So all through the scriptures I'm going to read today, it just says his servant, his servant, his servant, but we believe that it's Eleazar. It could be somebody else, but that makes sense that, that it's that name. And I believe there's a, there is a reason that we don't have that name, that the name that God had for this whole story is not in there. I'll get to that at the end, near the end. He sent Eliezer on a mission impossible adventure. Now Eliezer had to travel 450 miles by camel to an area where Abraham grew up. And once he got there, he was to select a suitable bride for Isaac and bring that bride back to marry Isaac. Can you imagine Eleazar as he's getting ready to go? I'm supposed to ride, and he, had, and he took 10 camels, and he had other men with him. I'm supposed to ride 450 miles and find a very beautiful virgin woman to come and marry Isaac, and she's supposed to come back with me? He's probably thinking, well, at least it's a paid vacation. <laughs> it's not a vacation. You know, yeah. Well, this prospective bride also had to be Abraham's distant relatives. Because the custom then, it was a lot of times you married your cousin, your first cousin. So it had to come from Abraham's family. 
Then after finding such a woman, he would have to convince her to marry Isaac and come back with a pretty, uh, pretty good uh, test of a job, a, di a difficult job. Now, when I look at the story, I often wonder what the certain individuals in the job were thinking, in the, in the, in the story were thinking about. What was Eleazar thinking about when he went on that journey? Was he going, no way, there's no way. You ever try to do something and you're thinking, there's just no way this is going to happen. Abraham asked Eleazar to swear he would not get a wife from, for Isaac from among the Canaanites but would get him a wife from his own relatives in western Mesopotamia. By putting his hand under Abraham's thigh, the slave would, uh, uh, you know, Eliezer, would be indicating that the oath that he was doing, he would carry it out, and he was in line of what God had promised Abraham. Now look with me, starting in verse number 5. It says, the servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country from where you came from? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land, who spoke to me and promised me an oath, saying, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son. So uh, Abraham saying, God's going to send an angel so you can get a wife. Verse 8, if the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you are released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. I believe he said that because I believe he was fearful that Isaac would go back, find a woman, and the woman would say, no, we're going to get married, but we're going to stay here. And then Isaac wouldn't live in the land that God had given him. Verse 9, so the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Now, Eleazar had some real concerns that the woman he would find would not come back with him. Now that makes a lot of sense to me. But let's think about why he had that fear. He was told to go find a woman that would eventually be Isaac's wife and then he was to blindly bring her back to him. What would any woman be thinking about in a situation like that? Any of you ladies would like that deal? Some guy comes with a, with a bunch of camels and says, hey, I want you to marry my son or my, my servants or my boss's son. Come with me, 450 miles on these camels. And when you get there, you'll be his wife. You may want to <laughs> say you're crazy. No picture. I mean, I'm sure, that, I'm sure any normal person would say, what does this 40-year-old look like? Is he a nerd? Is he a total loser? Why can't he find a wife on his own? Does the guy look like a dog? Why is it you want me to go marry him and I don't even know what he looks like? Now see, those are some natural thoughts that any woman would have. But Abraham was confident that God would send his angel to prepare the situation to make it possible for Eleazar to find a wife. Genesis 24, starting in verse 10, it says, Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and left taking with him all kinds of good things from his master. And he set out for Abram Nehirim and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was evening and it was time for the women to go out to draw water. He, they prayed, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. Notice that he, what he prayed. Give me success today. Now this prayer was simple. It was specific. And it also was time specific. Today. I want an answer today, Lord. He asked God to direct him in the right to the right girl and to do it right away. <laughs> you know, sometimes prayers are, you know, you've got to have a lot of faith to pray that kind of prayer. He just knew that God was going to take care of him. Now, in order to know which girl would be the right one, Eleazar added to his request to the Lord. And she, and, and, and she not merely just give me a drink, but after uh, she gives me a drink, I want her to offer water to my camels too. To voluntarily water ten thirsty camels. Now, I'm not a camel farmer. I don't know what they drink, but if you got ten of them, I would think they would, draw, uh, they would drink a lot of water. And she probably had to draw a lot of buckets of water out of the place so that they could drink. Eleazar knew the kind of hospitality, hospitality 
that characterized Abraham. So the test would be if, if, if this girl could show him the same kind of hospitality that he knew that Abraham had and wanted for his family. Verse 13, see, I'm standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming up to draw water. May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out from her, uh, with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethel, son of Mab Milkai, who, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. See, it's Abraham's brother who this, uh, and it turns out she's the grandchild of Abraham's brother. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had laid, ever lain with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Verse 18, Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar from her hand with her hands and gave me a drink. After she had given me a drink, she said, I'll draw water from, for the camels too until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all the camels. I would suspect that that's probably a lot of water. Verse 21, without saying a word, the man watched her closely, Eleazar, watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. Now, he had just thrown a fleece up to God. God, when I, when I get a drink and I ask for a drink and she gives me a drink, Lord, I want her to say, that, hey, I'll, I'll water your camels too. And she does that and then he's like, okay, still watching her to make sure that this is the right one for Isaac. Wasn't enough that she decided to water all those camels. Eliezer had prayed for a specific way that she would respond and that was that she would voluntarily want to water his camels. And she did exactly that. Eliezer watched without saying a word. Verse 22. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring weighing a becca and two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels. I'll tell you what those, how much those are worth in a minute. Then he asked, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? He answered her, I am the daughter of Bethel, the son of Milchai, born of Nahor. And she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder, as well as a room for you to spend the night. Eliezer, as a token of appreciation, took out that nose ring. The nose ring weighed one-fifth of an ounce. The two gold bracelets weighing about four ounces, and he gives them to her. These are gifts to her. Then he asked her who her father was, as we I just read. God had answered Eleazar's prayer. Rebekah, as it turns out, was a distant relative of Abraham. <laughs> Everything was lining up for Eleazar. <clears throat> now, was she really willing to leave her family? Well, we, if we read further, yes, we find out that she is willing to leave her family and go with Eliezer. And they want her, to, her family wants her to stay a while. He goes, no, i got to leave right away. You've got to come. It's now or never, kind of. That's in the scripture. I'm not going to read all those verses, but it's there. God did not just answer Eliezer's prayer with a little, yes. Is this the girl? Yes. He didn't, God didn't answer that way. Yes, she offered water for Eliezer to drink. Yes. She was offered water to the, she offered water to the camels. Yes, she was related to Abraham. Yes, she was beautiful. Yes, she was an available virgin. And yes, she was willing to travel with him all those miles, all the way back to marry Isaac. That's a long way to go. And you know what that meant at that time? You go that many miles away from your family by camel, it's not like they're going to come see you every third weekend. Abraham had the good fortune of gaining a non-Canaanite daughter-in-law to be the mother of his children, grandchildren, I mean. Rebekah became an essential part of God's promise to Abraham, and he would become the father of many nations. And that's why Rebekah is such an important part, obviously, of Abraham's lineage. Rebekah received a husband who loved her. 
She also got a place in the royal line of the Messiah. Isaac's life was changed because he received a very beautiful wife. Rebekah's life was also changed dramatically. Now, prior to these events, Eleazar viewed God solely as God's Abraham, not necessarily his own, but instead of that personal relationship, it was like, well, that's Abraham's God. That's not my God. Well, after he experienced God moving in such an incredible way, what is the, the word says? He dropped down and he worshiped God himself. He saw that God had provided the answer. We see in Genesis 24, starting in verse 26. Then the man bowed down and he worshiped the Lord, saying, Praise be to this Eliezer. Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on a journey to the house of my master's relatives. He acknowledged the fact that God was with him and God took care of him and answers his prayer as well. So now Eleazar has his own testimony of how God worked on his behalf. So he immediately dropped down and began to worship God. He didn't wait for Sunday to come, the Sabbath to come. He thanked God for leading him right to his master's relatives. Now if God is willing to do that for Eleazar, he surely will be able to do that for each of us today. Eleazar's one tiny prayer had a tremendous impact on many, many thousands of lives. Here's a few things. Now, so that was kind of the introduction. Now, I want to quickly do my quick points, quick points, because then we're going to turn it over. Here's some things that we learned from this story. Number one, prayer is for everyone. Prayer is for everyone. Why is it, I mentioned this earlier, why is it in the story it was always Abraham's servant and never listed his name as Eliezer? Why is that? I believe God was trying to tell us that it don't matter if you're a big body or a nobody in the kingdom, God still answers your prayers. Now, I don't know about you, but I think we all feel like nobodies most of the time. Number two, God answered a selfish sounding prayer. You say, that was a self... Yeah, God, give me an answer now. I want to know if this is the girl, and I, and I need to know today. Give me success today, he says. And God answered it in the affirmative. We must remember that it's not wrong to pray what might seem to be selfish prayers. If we don't, we may miss out on many of God's answers. We all here at the church have been praying for Grandma. For all those weeks, weeks, a couple months, she was in the hospital. Was that a selfish prayer? Yeah, we want to grab our back with us. And God answered our prayers. It may sound selfish to pray those kind of prayers. It may sound selfish to pray for your parents. It may sound selfish to pray for your child. But in reality, you are praying for them, not just you. Number three, God is very eager to answer prayer. Notice that verse 15 says about Eleazar. Before Eleazar finished praying, God answered his prayer. Rebecca came out before his prayer had even ended. Now, I don't know about you, but that isn't how all of my prayers end. You know, there's not many that I'm still praying and all of a sudden God's answering them right there. I can't think of one in my entire life. But it happened to Eleazar. When we ask God for good things and with worthy motives, he is going to respond and he is going to respond quickly. Too often we have the misconception that God is reluctant to answer our prayers. We sometimes think that he must be begged or manipulated or argued about into answering them. We must still seek him in faith, believing that he wants to answer our prayers and answer them right away. Now we would all be much better off <laughs> being guilty of asking for more prayers than what we received as opposed to missing out on answers of prayer because we didn't pray enough of them. So the idea is to pray all sorts of prayers so God can answer a bunch of them instead of not praying and not getting many answers at all. Number four, when you pray, give God a specific target. Eleazar gave him a specific target. I want you to bring this woman out. I want you to do it. I want you to do it today, Lord. I mean, uh, that was his prayer. Eliezer asked God that a very special woman would not only offer him a drink, but would offer water for his camels. If we want specific answers, then we need to ask specific prayers to 
to God. So when you pray, don't be specific with God on what you don't. Let's be specific with God on what we want. While I'm praying for the November 3rd election, I'm being specific. Well, I'm not going to tell you what I say, but I'm, I'm being specific with what I want God to do. I want him to put, I'll say that, you know, I want him to put men of righteousness and women of righteousness into these positions in our nation. Don't be generic, because it's hard to know when God answers prayers like that. Now when I say I want God to put men of righteousness and women of righteousness, sometimes the people aren't, aren't righteous themselves, but they do righteous things, you know what I'm saying? Now today, we're going to hear a testimony from Alice. And uh, Rosemary, does this mic up here work? This, this handheld? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, see if that. Paul, you want to grab that mic there and just see. We're going to hear a testimony from Alice and her mother. Obviously, Alice is going to be a, our interpreter here. But we all have been praying specifically that God would spare her life. We all thought she was 75 years old, but I just learned lately that no, she's 88 years old. God restored her health from having COVID-19. God be the Lord. It was on April the 14th, she was shipped off to Omaha and released on June the 8th. Paul, oh, my head or my... <coughs> Can she sit here? Yeah, this one. Okay. Can you? Let's give her a hand. She's saying that she's the one the Lord has saved. She's the one the Lord has healed. She's the one. Put the mic the to your mouth. The Lord has yes. left up from her back to life. Amen. That's what she <coughs> The song says, if my mouth is wide enough, I will thank the Lord, I will praise the Lord until the whole world asks me why. Amen. That's what I said. <coughs> What have I done that the Lord is so good to me? I am not worthy, but He is still so good to me. Amen. Glory be to God in the highest. I thank everybody for the prayer. You guys have been praying for me. I am so happy to be here today to share with you guys. Amen. I was so sick, I didn't know what was happening to me when I woke up. Because on that day, uh, 14 of April, I woke up as I normally do, took my shower, ate my breakfast, read my Bible, and prayed. As I did all I normally do in the morning, 
I didn't know that that day would be a different day for me. I went back to bed. Then the next thing I remember, I was somewhere and I didn't know what happened. And I saw people holding me, this one doing this, this one doing that. I didn't know what was happening. <laughs> when, when I looked around, things were different. I didn't know where I was. I read in the Bible that God raised people from dead. And uh, when I was laying there, when I was seeing what was going on, I didn't think that I would be able to meet you guys again, share with you guys again. But I thank God that today I am a living testimony. Yes. That God still yes. God still yes. people from there back to life. So I am one of them. Amen. 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 Woo. Amen. Um, that she is so thankful that she's a living person today because what was happening to her, she knew that outside God she will not be alive. But God intercede and answer all the prayers. And she is so thankful and to God and to everybody for all the prayers and for all the crying and for all the, all the weeping. So she's so grateful to God for what God has done for her. For her. Glory be to God in the highest. Sing your song again. Pastor Grace, you to sing that song. We give you glory. Give you the glory. She wants to sing a song. We give you glory. Your granddaughter should come sing with her. Her granddaughter should mm -hmm. come sing. Come sing with her. Mm -hmm. yeah.
what God has done for me. Because on April 14, when my mom got sick, I didn't know. I didn't know what to do. She woke up that morning like she said. She was healthy. There was nothing wrong. I've been taking her temperature, monitoring her oxygen every morning. That morning, temperature was like 97. She didn't have any fever. She did not have any problem. Our water sample was 96 percent. The same oxygen saturation. The amount of oxygen in our blood was 97 percent. So there was nothing wrong. She normally called because of the medication she's taking for blood pressure. And so I, I didn't see that there was anything abnormal in her. But she went to the bathroom around 9 o'clock. She came out and she called me. I can't breathe. I said, okay, go to your room. Let me get a set of so I can look, uh, listen to your lungs. So as I went to my room, my room is opposite our room. She had this nasty breathing that if you take care of people who are dying, you know that when somebody breathes that kind of breathing, that's the last one. And there will be another one. So I run, I left my, I throw the bag down, I didn't take the stethoscope. I went to her room, I hold her, and she was like, <laughs> trying to tell me what was. I said, don't tell me anything. I started covering her with the blood of Jesus. I bleed the blood of Jesus on her. I have all in all in all in all in my room. I asked for somebody to brought it, so I anoint her in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I put the blood of Jesus all over her. I said, call 911. They called 911, and they came because I knew that it was bad. So they took her out, and I was just recovering from COVID-19 that morning. I was, I didn't have any fever that morning, so I was thanking God, I was praying, I was worshiping God, and she worshiped God with me before this happened. And then all of a sudden this happened, I didn't know what to do, but I called 911 and they came in, they took her. You know when something happened to you, you don't even know what you're doing. I was thinking, I didn't know what to do. I call her, I think I was naked when I call her because I was trying to put my pants on, changing my pyjama. Then I call her on a video call and she like, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming because I didn't know what to do. She came over and she drove me to the hospital and St. Francis did so well. It was so fast. They had to intubate her right away and they had to flip her on her back because her lungs were so bad. So this COVID-19 is terrible, terrible disease. It can kill people silently. Yeah. So by the time you realize you are infected, it can do terrible, terrible thing in your body. So that was what happened to her. Her mom was already, already damaged before she got that, um, she had started having a hard time breathing. So they, uh, St. Francis had to intubate her and shipped her right away to Bacon Mercy Hospital which I give God all the glory for all the doctors and nurses at St. Francis and Bacon Mercy for the anointing because you have to be, you have to be specially qualified to do the job they were doing on our body. And God gave them all the knowledge, all the wisdom. Amen. So she was shipped out there right away. I couldn't even talk. I was scared to say what. So I had to ask my sister, stay in the way to speak for me. When they call, I want to hear them talking, but I don't want to talk because I was scared of what they're going to tell me. So she spoke for me. And they said they're going to intubate her. You have to interpret to her. So I told her, this is what they're going to do. Please, Ma, don't disgrace me. You came to visit me. Please, don't die in America. I want to take you back to my uh, brothers in Nigeria, so and sister in Nigeria, so you can say goodbye to all of us together, not yet in America. And she told me, I will. I will not disgrace you. I said, go with the Lord. The Lord is with you. He will protect you and bring you back home. She answered me, I know. And I hear you, and it will happen so and then we put the tube in her mouth. And she was on ventilator from that April 14 for one month. And the doctor keep calling me that I've never seen anybody on a ventilator for so long. And they keep calling me. There was these two good times they called me. The doctor told me, we have done everything. There is no way out. So I think it's about time you come over and say goodbye. I told the doctor, no, I am not going to say goodbye. Things will turn around in Jesus' name. Doctor, in Jesus' name, things will turn around. Please do everything you can. God will give you.
you all the knowledge, all the wisdom you need to save her life. Please do it in Jesus' name. Yes. And he listened to me, Dr. Austin. He said, okay, keep praying. <laughs> so I cried with Stephanie Wade and she called people all over the church and called the church member and everybody prayed. And all the, my relatives in Canada, in Dubai, in Nigeria, they have prayer chain praying for her. And they called another time and he said, we, you pray, you've done everything. There's no way. Our lungs is still not responding. So we don't have people on ventilator for this long. She has been on it for so long. So I think our body is trying to get rid of it. We have to do something. So that's why we're calling you. And I told the doctor, in the name of Jesus, things will turn around. Please do something yes. to save our life. God will give you all the knowledge you need, all the wisdom you need to turn things around. Amen. And he just listened to me and wait and wait. And a little bit he said, okay, keep praying. We'll see you next week. And this is weekend. That was on a Friday. This is a weekend. We'll see by next week what is going to happen. Um, I'll call you on Monday. I said, okay, thank you. And I was with Stephanie Wedi at that time too. She heard everything the doctor was saying. And she called everybody, the church, and friends around, and they start praying again, lifting her up. And um, it was a terrible, terrible, but I've never felt that way in my life. And um, I always have a vision. But since my mom went to hospital, I had no vision of any kind. So I was like, my, my nieces were even making fun of me because I would be asking them, have you seen something? Has God told you anything? Have you seen any vision? And they'll be like, no. And they'll be laughing at me because I'll be asking. I even asked anybody, has God revealed anything to you? And he said, no, nothing. So I was like, okay, is this going to be the end of her? And no, it's not going to be. And so I keep trusting God as little as I could. Because there was a time when I couldn't even know what I was saying. I couldn't even know what I was praying. I was just trusting God in what the pastors, all of my sisters and brethren, they were praying for. I just said, God, use their faith, use their strength and lift me up. And I could remember a time, you know, like when I was so down, there was a day it was so bad. Paula sent me a text and it was like everything that was happening to me. And she sent me that text. I know God was thinking about me. God was, God was with me. And so I just want to let you know that we read in the Bible that God raised Lazarus from dead, healed the sick, and made the limp person walk, and made the blind see. Yes, it is true. She was dead. And God rose her from dead back to life. Yes, so if you don't believe in God, that God is still doing that thing, yes, it is. Yes. And he will never change. His word is yes and amen. amen. He said, heaven and death will pass away, but my word will never change. And those are the words I was holding on to. I said, you said this in the Bible. You said, heaven and death will pass away, but your word will last forever. You never lie and you'll never lie and you can't lie now. So that was what I was using to trust God and believe that one day he will raise my mom from death back to life. And so it was on that fateful day when the doctor called me back and said, she's opening eye now. I think we can move and do tracheostomy. Tracheostomy is a, a tube, an artificial airway that they open here in your uh, throat so that you can be able to breathe if you cannot breathe by through your mouth and nose. So I told the doctor, yes, go ahead and do that. So they did that. When they did that, this is already 30 days on ventilator. And everybody knows when you are on ventilator, there's some damage that can be done in your throat, in your windpipe. So they were afraid those things will happen to her. So that's why they did the train. And they opened the train. They had to put a tube in so that they can feed her because she couldn't eat by mouth. And they did all that to save her life. I just thank God that because God is so faithful. She had a blood clot in her lungs. When I went to visit her in the hospital, the doctor showed me the x-ray. 
there were a lot of blood clot in our lungs. May God heal that and dissolve all that blood clot. She's a living testimony. I want to tell you, if you have not believed, if you haven't believed that there's a living God, yes, there is a living God. You, your problem, whatever problem you have, God can solve that problem for you. Just trust in God and tell people about it. They will pray. They will lift you up as they did on my mother. So I just want to use this opportunity again to thank God. Since I came to this church, I know I have a lot of good things happening. I have never shared with the audience like this. In 2016, or before 2016, and you guys can remember, when the pastor, when we were paying for this uh, building, there was a day the pastor said that everybody should buy a square feet for this building. Yes. And then I had a son, my, I have a son, David. He had a, a girl he was going to marry in Nigeria, but he didn't want to marry that girl again after I came to America. My heart broke, even though I don't have a girl. And I always tell my children, let your yes be yes and where your no be no. When you tell somebody I love you, make sure it is the real love. Don't say something and then you don't do it. So I, my heart was broken when he told me he was not going to marry that girl again. I, I cried to the Lord. I came here and prayed. Paula prayed with me, but I didn't tell her what I was praying about. So on that day when pastor said that we should uh, buy the plot, so I make it upon myself. A covenant with God that I'm going to buy this plot square feet for David and Sarah as they're going to be husband and wife that they will come to this church and worship God and I did that so in 2016 Sarah was here during uh, Samuel's graduation and she came to this church and worship God and they are married today for the glory of God so God can turn impossible into possible any situation, there was no, everybody was like, there was no way for David and Sarah to be back. David in America, Sarah in Nigeria. But God made it happen. Again in 2016, when I went to that marriage, marriage ceremony in Nigeria, I was robbed. As I got down in a city called Portacot, it's a closer city to, closer city to my city. So I decided to flew to that area so that I can get home right away. And I've never been through that route, but somebody told me that, oh, it will be cheap and short for you to get home. So I don't have to spend a night in the hotel, and I did. So when we got halfway leaving the airport, I got robbed. Everything was taken away. I was beaten. We were all beaten. But we thank God they did not do anything dangerous to us. They took everything we had. My passport, my son's passport, my son's ID, who, is, who was working in the airport at that time, was taken. All I did was, I was just lying on the ground, I said, Lord, this is not my covenant with you. You didn't plan this for me. I'm not going to die here. And they were shooting, who, 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 all over the place. And I was thinking was my children. Oh, this is the last time I'm going to see my children. I prayed. I said, God, let them take everything I have. Let them take everything we have, save our life. I was just laying on the ground, I was praying, and they took everything. There was somebody who was speaking in a different language I couldn't understand. I don't know if he wanted to kill us, or to rape us, or do some dangerous things to us. One of them came and said, no, no, and pushed him away. And they went to the bush, and they saw the money, and said, oh, this is dollars? He said, yes, this is the U.S. dollars. We said, yes. And they took the money and then they came and told us to get into the car. They shoot, they blow all the windshield. And we were saved that day. They took everything. In the morning, that night was the longest night in my life. One of the longest nights in my life. In the morning, I was able to call my brother. All the phone, everything was taken away. And then we talked, contact the police. In my area, they said so, that last week seven people were robbed at that place and they killed all of them. They were all dead. But God saved our lives. Like the song my mom was singing, God is so good to me. Why? What have I done to deserve this kind of goodness? God saved my life that day. And then in 2020, this happened again to me. You know, everybody here about COVID did. And my job, we lost 25 people. And God spared my life. 
and God saved my mother's life. Yes. Why? I am not worthy for all this. I am not worthy for all what God is doing for us. But I just want to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God the Father. Thank you, God the Son. God, God the Father, God the Son. I worship you. I glorify you. I cannot thank you enough. I cannot worship you enough for what you've done for me. Glory, honor, and being one to you. And only you alone. Only you deserve all the praise, all the honor. Thank you, Jesus. So I just want you guys to hear what God has done for me. And I thank you, God. I thank you all for all your prayers, being there for me, crying with me. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I'm so grateful what God has done for me. Because I was thinking, how am I going to carry my mother's corpse to Nigeria? Where do I start? How do I start doing this? I was thinking about all that. But God made it easy for me. Today she's alive. She's a living person. To tell the world that yes, there is Jesus. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the same. He never changed and he will never change. He who made a way out for the children of Israel to pass through the Red Sea is able to do it again and again and again. So he did it for me. And you guys can see. So glory be to God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah, we have another song to sing, please. Yes. They're getting ready. This is going to be our benediction song here the goodness of God. And God has been good to Alice and her mom and her family. You know.
Yes, Lord, let our lives sing of your goodness each and every day. You're the one who is above it all, over it all. Amen. You will carry us through it all. We trust you, we love you, we bless you and honor you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.